um, you know, having individual senators or representatives to root for or whatever the case may be and certain uh, uh, witnesses or, or uh, whatever that you want to boo or applaud or whatever the case may be. However, the thing to remember, and uh, one of the reasons that... Uh, that we and Dave in particular have spent so much time uh, doing the putting together these broadcasts and sharing them with you is that it's extremely important stuff going on and it's only the fact that this story broke um, in the way that it has that a lot of these names that uh, the Dave and I and May Brussel and other people have been talking about for years and years ever came into the sort of uh, wide uh, wide-angle public consciousness. Richard Secord, now half the country has seen Richard Secord on television. Five years ago, there were a few small voices shouting in the wilderness about Richard Secord and Ed Wilson and others and their Ill illicit traffic and drugs and guns and um, their basic uh, personal foreign policy, which they were making on behalf of the United States. So it is beneficial that way, but it is always important to remember these people are playing with real guns, real drugs, and real money, and uh, we should take them very seriously. Indeed. Uh, one of the things that we looked at in our last broadcast, and we will be coming back to in a big way during the cover-up broadcast, the concluding part of the series, are the number of people that have dropped dead just as their names have cropped up in the investigation, or the number of people who have dropped dead shortly before their names cropped up in the investigation. As Nip indicated, this is indeed a very serious uh, time in the world's history. Well, in fact, the last uh, six, seven years have been critical a critical period. That's one of the reasons, the main reason, that we've gone public and uh, following May Brussel are uh, using the radio to essentially call people's attention to information in the printed news media or in books. This is sort of a, a mixed media experience. We're basically using broad the broadcast medium to call people's attention to the print. And uh, one of the, one of the, one of the, the perhaps the strongest feature of the situation we find ourselves in with regard to the Iran-Contra scandal is also, at least uh, from my standpoint, Nip, I don't know how you feel about it, one of it was something which in, in one sense almost makes it difficult to talk about. The, the people we've been talking about, Theodore Shackley, Thomas Kleins, the Turple Wilson team in particular, who we're going to focus on this evening in a big way, we have been perhaps ad nauseum for some people talking about them for a long, long time. Uh, Long-time listeners to the broadcast will uh, recall us harping on the Turple Wilson team six years ago. I, I came across a, a, an old One Step Beyond show from October of 1981, and the, virtually the entire prepared portion of the broadcast consisted of information about Turple Wilson, and indeed, uh, even then, we were referring back to all of our other broadcasts. At that point on, on One Step Beyond, I was functioning behind the scenes in uh, working on the prepared portion and functioning as the mojo wire, but it, it was a group effort at that point. But uh, it, it sometimes... And during the course of some of the broadcasts we've done, like the program that we just did on the drug connections a couple of weeks ago, I found myself at a loss for words or else simply invoking all of the past material that we did. In particular, having done the five-part series on the intelligence community's involvement in the narcotics traffic beginning in November of 1986, when those connections then became one of the major stories in the country. Well, they've always been a major story. For a change, they began to get covered. Now, uh, you can turn on something as relatively staid as West 57th Street, the new, uh, the new documentary series on CBS, and they will talk about it. Uh, it's very gratifying in one sense to see the material that we've been focusing on finally getting the attention from other media that they deserve. At the same time, as, as I said, I find it uh, difficult to escape uh, perhaps a, a bit of cliché as, as we describe these things. It, uh, it sounds maybe a little corny or a little self-righteous to say, well, these are all the things we've been talking about. You know, we've been talking about Traficante, we've been talking about Coru, we've been talking about Guns for Drugs, we've been talking about Triple Wilson. But uh, in fact, we have, and it's, uh, it's stunning in one sense and almost a little frustrating because we, uh, past uh, the point of reviewing the facts, there isn't a heck of a lot that we could say that we haven't already said uh, almost to the point of exhaustion. So if we seem perhaps at times a trifle on the cliched side or hackneyed side, it's because when you've said something a couple <laughs> of hundred thousand times, literally it, it becomes difficult to try and sound a, uh, to, to make it sound fresh. And I, I don't know, I, I have found that, more, the, 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 again, the, the strongest part of our effort is, is in one sense the weakest in that it, it's difficult to... Uh, avoid that kind of hackneyed, cliched uh, present, you know, the style. You know, I'm talking about the words 
when, when we've literally been talking about this thing for seven years. Now, nonetheless, well, you have to get your tapes fired up because we're going to have some other stuff to throw in tonight, and we're also going to be putting some things in different perspectives mm -hmm. than they have been held here to for. So this is not, uh, by any means, an excuse for you all to turn off your tape recorders or anything, um, although Dave is absolutely right. Uh, the, the, the flip side, of course, to, to what Dave was just talking about was that um, uh, all of a sudden this, this whole line of uh, reasoning has gained a great deal more credibility. Um, and this is, this is a good thing that has come out of this, as I was talking about at the top of the broadcast, that um, for the first time when you begin to talk about these things, there is a certain group of people who were previously um, sort of radically apathetic about the whole thing who are beginning to understand, yes, it does happen. And that was their major block, their major hurdle as far as being interested in it, was the idea, well, it's too weird to be true. Well, of course, it's not too weird to be true, and if anybody had bothered to examine the evidence, they would have seen that it was uh, obviously quite true. But now it, they've been, a lot of people have been forced to deal with the fact, the, the, these, these facts, um, in uh, a way that they only have to deal with about every 10 years or so. You know, when a Watergate comes up or, uh, you know, a Bay of Pigs or something, and for a moment this, this kind of stuff uh, s uh, surfaces, and then as soon as possible, people turn their backs again. So well, right now we're enjoying a few, uh, a compar comparatively a few minutes of, of uh, high profile, and we intend to take advantage of it. And uh, the last word that I'm going to say before we get into the hardcore material is that uh, be precisely because we are in a time when people are more willing to listen to some of the things that uh, we've been talking about, some of the things that are coming to light, it is incumbent, I think, on all of you out there who don't want to see the kind of characters who have pulled off the Iran-Contra scam in permanent charge of U.S. policy, because they are now, and they're going to stay that way, and it's going to get worse if people don't get off their tail feathers. One of the main reasons why we're uh, pushing this Iran-Contra Radio Free America series at this time is one of the reasons why, uh, in addition to our transmitter problems, we uh, haven't been able to fulfill a couple of the commitments in terms of time, is that it's very important to get this information distributed. I would strongly encourage people to not only use the material, say, of the Christic Institute, which we're going to rely on in part this evening, but to perhaps distribute some of these tapes as well, because there is some information uh, in this that is not necessarily in the Christic Institute suit. So we feel that we've, uh, we have hemmed and hawed here enough. If you're not ready, if you haven't got your tape recorder fired up and loaded, well, that is tough luck because we are going to proceed. <laughs> we've done what we can. The first thing we're going to read from tonight, and remember what we're starting tonight, although it's going to sound a little bit like what we were talking about last week, and of course, in a way, these things are inextricably interlinked, and uh, there's no way of pretending that the drug traffic and the, uh, the, the terror traffic are somehow divisible. Um, and possible to separate, but there are places where um, names particularly tend to fall to one side of it or the other, and uh, we're going to be looking primarily at the terror side of things tonight, and specifically the terror side in Latin America. Although, it, again, it should be reiterated that the distinctions between all of these various categories are largely for conceptual purposes. In fact, they all intersect and, and run into one another. Which is one of the things that makes our job so much fun. Uh, the first thing we're going to be reading from is a book called Hot Money, and the Politics of Debt. The book is by R.T. Naylor, who is an associate pro professor of economics at McGill University, and it's copyright 1987, published by the Linden Press from Simon & Schuster in New York. And what we're going to be talking about here is the uh, something we've discussed at some length, which is the origins of the, uh, the Sandinistas slash uh, Fidel Castro, Castro slash Robert Vesco drug dealing story that was floated by the U.S. government in 1984. Again, at the time, uh, Dave and I and May Brussel and others had to sort of laugh publicly about this because, uh, it, you know, if there was ever a case of flying directly in the, in the face of truth, um, this was it. And calling the Sandinistas drug dealers when the U.S. and the Contras have been dealing drugs in a big way uh, is something to uh, snicker about in a sad sort of way. We began our last program with an article from Covert Action Information Bulletin in which Fred Landis pointed out that among the disinformation programs begun by the Iran Contra Gate team was an attempt on the part of Oliver North to and, and Richard Secord to set up a sting, quote unquote, in which the Sandinistas would be labeled as marketing the cocaine coming from the Medellin cartel, so named after the sex the segment of Colombia, the section of Colombia where it operates out of. As we looked at, in fact, the DEA agent and quite possibly CIA agent as well who was functioning in order to set up this sting also was working for the DEA to bust the Medellin cartel. This was a fellow named Adler Barry Seal. The plane he used 
for the Federico Vaughn sting was in fact the plane that Eugene Hassenfuss was shot down on uh, a couple of years later. As we saw, the Medellin cartel was in fact working very closely, not with the Sandinistas, but with the Contras themselves in providing cocaine to help generate working capital. We uh, look, took a look at that in the last broadcast, the Medellin cartel connections in considerable detail. We're going to be coming back to those uh, intermittently during the course of the broadcast this evening, and we will, we will also be referring back to the assassination of Adler Barry Seal, connections to the gun shop of Jose Coutin, and others. All right, reading from R.T. Naylor's Hot Money. Um, again, they're talking about this story of the alliance between the left-wing groups, uh, in this case to begin with Colombian left-wing groups, and drug dealers. The story got increasingly complicated with each telling. Fidel Castro was supposed to have brokered a deal between the Colombian drugs mafia and the pro-Cuban M-19 guerrilla group. The drugs mafia provided arms in exchange for assistance in marketing drugs, and the Cuban government took its cut in hard currency. This tale was later embellished by bringing into it Robert Vesco, then hiding out in Cuba. According to this version, Vesco, the former exporter of machine guns to right-wing paramilitaries in Central America, had joined forces with the government of Nicaragua, then combating a U.S. armed and funded right-wing insurgency, in a conspiracy to export Colombian cocaine to the U.S. Whether the major traffickers also planned, during their alleged meetings at the Vitoshi Hotel in Sofia, meaning Sofia, Bulgaria, to finish the job Ali, Ali Aja left uncompleted has not yet been revealed. But an interesting and strangely familiar twist came in 1985 when Jorge Ochoa, Pablo Escobar and Carlos Rivas were tried in absentia in Miami for importing drugs into the U.S. via Nicaragua. Ochoa, who was arrested in Spain while trying to establish refining facilities to service the European market, told reporters that the idea of implicating Nicaragua had been given to him after his arrest by a U.S. DEA agent who was also a former CIA man. So, the... The may, one of the main subject matters that we be, we took up last week, we are beginning with this evening, and we will be coming back to it in certain respects throughout the course of the rest of the series. So we have Robert Vesco's name linked with the Sandinistas in order to smuggle Medellin cartel. Well, Vesco is an interesting fellow. We've dealt with Vesco at considerable length in Radio Free America program number 25. We're going to repeat much of that material from RFA 25 right now. One of the things that's so interesting about Robert Vesco's name being dragged into the uh, Sonanista Medellin canard is that Robert Vesco, in fact, has not only worked apparently for the CIA and the uh, narcotics traffickers, but specifically has worked with, among others, Santo Traficante and the right-wing Cuban mafia, which was instrumental in the CIA's anti-Castro efforts over the years. We took a look at Traficante with what the Christic Institute people termed the Shooters Team, put together to assassinate Fidel Castro and quite possibly involved not in the assassination of Castro, obviously, who's alive and well, but perhaps in the assassination of President Kennedy. So we're going to review now the, some of the information d linking Robert Vesco, not with left-wing drug traffickers, but in fact with right-wing drug traffickers and terrorists, and with Santo Traficante in particular. The book we're going to rely on for this section of the broadcast was the book we relied on in Radio Free America number 25. It's called The Great Heroin Coup, subtitled Drugs, Intelligence, and International Fascism. It's authored by Henrik Kruger with a foreword by Peter Dale Scott. And of the Vesco Traficante Alliance and their mutual connections to Mitchell Warbell, Kruger writes as follows. Oh, by the way, published by the South End Press in Boston in 1980 in soft cover. In a chapter called Guns for Drugs, Kruger writes. In August of 1976, Lucian Conin's chum, Mitch Werbel III, whose B.R. Fox company had shared a Washington office with Conin's DEA Special Operations Group, was brought before a Miami federal court on charges of conspiracy to, muggles 50, pounds of to smuggle 50,000 pounds of marijuana a month from Colombia to the United States. He and several co-conspirators had allegedly hatched the plot in the summer of 1975, just when Alberto Cecilio Falcón was arrested in Mexico. Multi-ton marijuana loads were to have been flown from Colombia to an isolated ranch in the Florida Everglades near the cow town of Okeechobee. The star prosecution witness was one of Rebel's close associates, the convicted cocaine and marijuana smuggler Kenneth Gordon Bernstein. However, weeks before his scheduled court appearance, he died in the mysterious crash of his P-51 Mustang at an air show. 
Most of the vital tape recordings and films of meetings between Bernstein, Werbel, and other defendants were no longer producible in court. Werbel's defense was that his role in the plot had been as an undercover agent for Conine. Both Conine and Egil Crow were to have been witnesses on his behalf, but Crow testified that he didn't know Werbel had worked for the DEA's special operations branch, and Conine wasn't called at all. Another defense witness was the soldier of fortune Jerry Hemming, whose private army of Cuban exiles and Americans, the, pe the International Penetration Force, appears from Hemming's description of its missions to have played an active role in Operation 40. During the trial, Hemming would stay late into the night in Werbel's room. Werbel was found innocent and released, just like the Thai opium smuggler CIA agent Putaporn Krom Kruan before him in 1973. He went home to Georgia to pursue his weapons business and law enforcement training camp. According to writer Hank Messick, in 1978 he was involved in far-right politics with the likes of Major General John K. Singlaub, who had been relieved of his command in Korea after his outspoken criticism of Jimmy Carter, and members of the American Security Council, the key U.S. link to the far-right's international umbrella organization, the World Anti-Communist League, or WACL. As reported recently in the New York Times, the beneficiaries of his anti-terrorist training have included members of the far-right, anti-Semitic U.S. Labor Party. Werbel owns eight companies, most of them dealing in firearms used by law enforcement and intelligence units. One of the firms, Studies in the Operational Negation, negation of Insurgents and Counter-Subversion, Psionics, specializes in the production of M10 and M11 silenced machine pistols. The latter two weapons, designed by Gordon Ingram and Werbel, are about the ultimate weapons for terror and extermination. Their sales agent was Werbel's Military Armament Corporation. Together with the anti-Castro Cuban arms dealers Anselmo Aviegro and the mercenary Jerry Hemming, Werbel founded the Parabellum Corporation in 1971 in Miami. Parabellum was licensed to sell arms in Latin America. It was also the firm from which Watergate burglar Frank, Burtz, Frank Sturgis planned to obtain weapons for Cuban exiles who were going to, but eventually did not, disrupt the 1972 Miami conventions. Before NIP continues, just recall that Operation 40, we talked about last time, CIA's anti-Castro guerrilla campaign, the uh, Lucian Conine, DEA man, putting together the uh, special operations group to eliminate drug dealers who were competing with Traficante. The M10, Mitchell Bell's toothpick, was used to kill, among others, Adler Barry Seal. Continuing. In 1974, Werbel, according to a motion filed by his own lawyer, when Werbel, his son, and his company, Defense Services, Inc., were charged with illicit weapons sales, was involved in a, quote, conspiracy among the CIA, Robert Vesco, and various corporations to finance clandestine guerrilla activities in Latin America, unquote. Okay, so that's according to his own lawyer. Vesco wanted to purchase Werbel's stock of 2,000 silenced M10 machine pistols. When Werbel failed to secure an export license, he devised a plan to smuggle the weapons to Vesco. The two later negotiated the construction of a factory in Costa Rica, which would be licensed to fabricate the pistols. Intriguingly, in that same period, someone was negotiating with a U.S. firm for rights to fabricate, in Mexico, fully automatic weapons for clandestine guerrilla actions in Latin America. That someone was Mexico's Cuban exile heroin czar, Alberto Cecilia Falcone, and among the weapons he was inspecting was the Ingram M10 9mm Parabellum. Although the M10 and M11 could be acquired legally only with the special permission of U.S. officials, large numbers of silenced M10s turned up in the hands of European fascist terrorists in 76 and 77. When Pier Luigi Concutelli, a leader of the Italian terrorist group Ordine Nuovo was arrested in Rome in February of 1977. Police found in his apartment the silenced M10, which he had used to murder the Rome magistrate Vittorio Ocorsio. Ocorsio had been shot down on the streets of Rome in July 1976 after announcing he would expose the close collaboration between fascist terror groups and the Mafia. However, it was among Spanish terrorists in particular that Werbel's machine pistols appeared in quantity. Most notably, a sizable consignment of M10s sent to Spain under license from U.S. authorities had been pur purchased by Spanish intelligence agency DGS, which has allegedly coordinated the actions of fascist terrorists. 
Uh, by the way, we should mention that one of the people with the, the one of the people running, essentially running DGS, uh, a man by the name of Otto Skorzeny, otherwise known as Hitler's commando, and uh, himself head of uh, of uh, Die Spinne, um, uh, the na- uh, exiled Nazi uh, operation, so closely tied to so many of these other fascist fronts we've been talking about. We talked about him in Radio Free America's number three. Well, we talked about him in a lot of shows, notably Radio Free America programs three and 22 in particular centered on him. Uh, we mentioned this because we're coming back to him in our next program on this, um, in this series. Continuing. The fugitive IOS, that's Investors Overseas, the corporation that uh, Vesco took over. The fugitive IOS billionaire Vesco employed a large contingent of Cuban exiles in his Costa Rica sanctuary. Moreover, his weapons negotiations coincided with the efforts of the fanatic anti-Castro Cuban leader Orlando Bosch to assemble Cuban exile groups into an army of terror, Coru, C-O-R-U, that would later carry out assassinations and other dirty work for several Latin American regimes. During Bosch's 1974 to 1975 drive, a wave of murder struck Miami's Cuban exile haven. Most victims had been opposed to Bosch. With the obstacles to his plan removed, Coru was established in June of 1976. While Vesco and Werbel were hatching their weapons deal, Bosch's base of operation just happened to be Vesco's Kingdom of Costa Rica, and Mafia heroin boss Santo Traficante Jr. was also reportedly there between January of 74 and the summer of 1975. Journalist Jim Hogan speculates in his book Spooks that the three might have joined forces in a CIA conspiracy to escalate anti-communist terror in Latin America. So remember now the the Werbel, Traficante, Orlando Bosch connection, their hookup in Peru, and their connections to Costa Rica, because these are going to loom large in the background. Continuing here. In 1973, some of the details began to surface in a series of scandals linking these individuals. DEA undercover agent Frank Peroff, P-E-R-O-F-F, charged Vesco with extensive heroin, with financing extensive heroin smuggling. For his initiative, Peroff was fired summarily and his life was threatened. Before the Senate Investigation Subcommittee could probe deeply, the case was squelched through the intervention of the White House. The Oval Office had already helped Vesco, a friend of the Nixon family, in his run-in with the Securities and Exchange Commission, which had sought his prosecution for the trail of swindle he had left in the world of international finance. Midway through the subcommittee investigation of the heroin charges, the DEA announced the disappearance of its Vesco file. One year later, as the subcommittee investigated Werbel's weapons deal with Vesco, it learned that Vesco had once employed government narcotics agents. In 1972, two bugging specialists from the BNDD, the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, flew from Los Angeles to New Jersey to sweep Vesco's home and office of surveillance devices. According to the subcommittee, The sweeping tour had been arranged by an admitted friend of Vesco's, who was also involved in supplying the fugitive with 2,000 machine guns and helping him establish a factory for the weapons in Costa Rica. Guess who? Interjecting, of course, that was Mitch Wobel. That's who Kruger's referring to. That was not the last heard of Robert Vesco in connection with drugs. In the summer of 1977, police uncovered the smuggling of large quantities of heroin and cocaine to Rhode Island. In one of the involved ships, they discovered a ledger in which it was written, quote, To Vesco, six million, he picked up with Shrimper Lansky. Courier beat up. Unquote. Several things point to Vesco involvement in the long-standing partnership of the CIA, the Lansky Traficante Syndicate, and the Cuban exiles in a drugs-for-guns-for-terror deal to step up armed suppression and anti-communism in Latin America. Journalist Hogan ventures that the conspirators might have used such go-betweens and couriers as the beautiful Patricia Richardson Martinson. According to her ex-husband, the former Army Intelligence Agent William Spector, Ms. Martinson had very close relationships with almost everyone of importance in the drug business. Youssef Baidas, B-E-I-D-A-S, the Lebanese founder and managing director of Intrabank, known as one of the major financiers of the heroin traffic, Paul Louis Weiler, W-E-I-L-L-E-R, a French financier similarly alleged to be behind the narcotics trade, Eduardo Barudi, a big-time heroin and gun smuggler suspected of having arranged Beda's mysterious death in Switzerland, Christian Beauserge David, Conrad Conrad Bouchard, B-O-U-C-H-A-R-D, a a top heroin trafficker trafficker heavily involved in Frank Peroff's Vesco heroin allegations, and Marcel Bouquin, B-O-U-C-A-N, 
The skipper of the Caprice du Temps, which was seized in 1972 with 452 kilos of pure heroin. Continuing. Yet another likely intermediary among the apparent conspirators is the CIA contract agent, arms dealer, art dealer, Fernand Legros. In 1971, the CIA helped get Vesco released from San Antoine prison in Geneva, where he had been arrested in the Bernard Kornfeld Investors Overseas Service case. Legros, spelled L-E-G-R-O-S, was in that same prison and spoke with Vesco. In January 1973, the two were reunited in Nassau. Legros was seen in the company of Bedas in Geneva and Rio de Janeiro. His closest friend was the convicted heroin trafficker André Labaye, a close associate of Haiti's Duvalier dynasty. In Geneva, Legros also met frequently with Eveline Hirsch, the wife of the imprisoned bankroller André Hirsch, whose South American heroin contact had been Christian David, otherwise known as Christian David. Just as the U.S. put the screws on the Paraguayan government for the extradition of Auguste Ricord, Legros was in Paraguay to close out a weapons deal with President Stressner. Later, when Legros was placed in protective confinement in Brazil, newspapers speculated on his involvement in the David or David Mobs narcotics deals. Recent years' investigations into the CIA-slash-organized crime connection have resulted in an epidemic of sudden deaths. In the CIA-DEA-VESCO syndicate scheme alone, one can mention Kenny Bernstein, or Bell associate Colonel Robert F. Bayard, who was shot down in, in an Atlanta parking lot in July of 1975. Another were Bell associate and co-defendant in his marijuana case, John Nardi, who was shot in Cleveland, and Vesco security chief Bobby Hall, who was shot to death in his Los Angeles home in July of 1976. After the Senate investigation subcommittee's attempted probe into the Vesco heroin case was sabotaged from the highest quarters, committee chairman Henry Jackson asked, quote, did the U.S. government wish to keep Vesco out of this country for some reason? Did he have some special information which he could supply to explain, in part, the national nightmare we have just lived through? One Senate investigator offered an answer. Quote, More than any single person, Vesco has information which, if he talked, would make Watergate look like a picnic. Unquote. So the point being here that uh, far from being an associate of left-wing drug traffickers, Robert... Nip, uh, we just... It's okay. Go ahead. Far from being, an, asso okay. Far from being an, uh, an associate of left-wing drug traffickers, Robert Vesco is in fact not only an associate of right-wing drug traffickers, but apparently, at least from the context here, a probable CIA agent as well. It's worth noting uh, a couple of things here. Now again, Santo Traficante was a key player in Operation 40, the CIA's anti-Castro-Cuban uh, adventures in the, mid, uh, in the mid and early 1960s. He also was the person who put together the Traficante Shooters Team, discussed in the last broadcast from the Daniel Sheehan affidavit put out by the Christic Institute. It's also worth noting, too, that uh, the whole Theodore Shackley Station JM Wave team was inextricably linked with narcotics trafficking, as we looked at in our last broadcast. Note the Traficante Vesco Orlando Bosch Association in Costa Rica. Orlando Bosch and his Coru organization are going to be major foci, not only of this broadcast, but we're also going to come back to them in a small way in the next broadcast as well. Also, note the, uh, the stomping ground, so to speak, that these people are using here, namely Costa Rica. Costa Rica and right-wing drug smuggling in particular are going to come into focus in a big way. Last but certainly not least, it should be mentioned that the Investors Overseas Services case was involved, well, it, it was a, a major scandal. Vesco basically built Investors Overseas Services and used it pri apparently for his narcotics trafficking. The person who helped squelch the investigation into Robert Vesco, and uh, recall the, uh, the Kruger statement that the, the Senate Investigation Subcommittee's probe in the Vesco heroin case was sabotaged from the highest quarters, the person in the SEC who basically helped cover up the Investors Overseas Service case was then head of the Securities and Exchange Commission, up until recently head of the CIA, William Casey, the late William Casey, whose death we're going to talk about in Part 4. Uh, another interesting thing, just to interject here before we go on to the next part, another interesting little uh, footnote here in Kruger's uh, presentation. 
reads like this. Somewhere among Robert Vesco's memorabilia floats the strange affair of the Brotherhood of Love. Through it, thousands of potential activists were stoned for years on LSD, and enormous profits from the sale of tablets were reinvested through the Investors Overseas Services Controlled Fiduciary Trust Company. Throwing that in just by way of... Uh, our, our observance of the Summer of Love, of course, that harkens back to Radio Free America number 28. But again, Vesco, Traficante, Mitch Werbel, Orlando Bosch, Costa Rica, Vesco's probable status as a CIA agent, certain status as a heroin trafficker, and William Casey's role uh, it, it's, is worth taking note of here. Now, proceeding with Henry Kruger's account... We're going to pick up here an account of uh, Kruger's detailing, and again, we've dealt with this in Radio Free America programs 26 and 27, of the use of the Traficante machine in Cuba, and we talked about that at considerable length, the, the Traficante machine in Florida, rather, the Cuban mafia, and the use of this organization for right-wing terror. Now, the DEA's special operations group, headed by Lucian Conin, referred to in the passage we just completed, is uh, basically, as we looked at in Radio Free America shows 26 and 27, appears to have been used not to eliminate the heroin traffic, but rather to eliminate competition for Santo Traficante's Cuban Mafia, and also to institute uh, far right-wing terror, not only in Latin America, but also in that part of Latin America known as Florida. Uh, they're obviously the, uh, the Miami connection, Miami Vice, so to speak, is inextricable with U.S. policy in the Southern Hemisphere. Beginning now with, uh, actually repeating from other Radio Free America broadcasts, Kruger's account of the formation of Koru and its intersection with the Special Operations Group of the DEA. It must have been a gag. This pay well, actually, let, let me begin the paragraph ahead. The emergence of the DEA was the next to last phase of the heroin coup. Hunt and Conine's CIA agents moved into the DEA intelligence and operations, Conine locating 12 Latino CIA agents in his special operations group alone. The Dirty Dozen was officially created to combat Cuban and Latin American narcotic smugglers, allegedly following the assassination approach conceived in the darkest corners of the White House. It must have been a gag. Conine's forces were apparently directed for the most part against small-time independents who had competed with the big-time traffickers in on the heroin coup. The biggest Cuban network, Santo Traficantes, went untouched. Miami's 1974-75 murder wave in Little Havana might even have been connected to the activities of Conine's Cubans. The victims had opposed Orlando Bosch's drive for solidarity and terrorism, a drive which, as suggested by writer Hogan, might well have enjoyed the support of Traficante and Robert Vesco. Of the latter two, certainly the first and quite possibly the second as well were central figures in the heroin coup. That brings us to the last, the political phase of the heroin coup, which began with the DEA's 1974 takeover of the CIA's Latin American torture and repression apparatus and ended with the 1976 creation of Coru, Bosch's terrorist mercenary army. Coru, by the way, is C-O-R-U. Ended is, however, the incorrect word since the brutalities financed by the heroin coup continue. The DEA or that part of it pe penetrated by the C CIA, let me begin again, the DEA, or that part of it penetrated by the CIA, protects the major narcotics dealers. The latter, in turn, support, financially and through gun running, anti-communist paramilitary groups which work hand-in-hand -hand with Latin American police and military forces, whose death squads and torturers are supervised by agents of the DEA. The infiltration of the DEA, and the variety of political assignments for its agents, have caused such violent splits within the Bureau that one can speak of two wings which fight one another. One wing carries out guns for drugs and protection programs. The other tries desperately to combat the drug traffic carried out or protected by the first. Among the expressions of this bitter internal strife, apparently, are the Cecilia Falcone and Werbel cases and the dismissal of DEA Director Bartels for suspected corruption. Recently, the use of drug profits to finance right-wing terrorism has been placed in a new perspective by revelations of Cuban exile teamwork with European and Latin American fascists and the economic support of Wackel for the same anti-communist groups. And that brings us to the final link in the chain of drugs, intelligence, and fascism. Well, of course, the, again, the main point that we're looking at here, the Traficante name, the formation of Karoo, is, is uh, the main thing to focus, focus on in this passage, because we're going to come to... 
Carew's role in a Latin American terror campaign and the intersection of some of the players in that terror campaign with the Iran Contra Gate team. Should also be noted here the uh, reference to the World Anti Communist League. John Singlob obviously is a major player in the Iran Contra scandal, and their connections to the very terror and drug smuggling unit elements that we've talked about here are worth bearing in mind. Now, as Dave mentioned, that uh, eventually a lot of these folks are going to connect up directly to uh, the Contragate hearings, the things that are going on, the people who are sitting in the docket and talking about uh, uh, Ollie North and uh, you know his single-handed subversion of uh, the otherwise uh, right on top of things Reagan administration. And uh, we just thought we'd point some of these things out to you. Uh, this has been going on for a long time, and as Dave mentioned, it is uh, it's a much much wider picture. And again, the the curious situation with regard to Adler Barry Seal, who was first recruited by CIA to help sting the Sandinistas, was recruited by DEA to help sting the Medellin cartel, and appears to have been assassinated by the first and third of those elements against the wishes of at least part of the second in order to cover up the uh, connections between the CIA and Medellin and the entire Iran-Contra team that we're talking about right here. And again, the another thing that's worth... Uh, taking a look at here. It's interesting how well Kruger has foreshadowed the Iran-Contra scandal. This book was published in 1980. Is the uh, the split within the DEA and the political use of DEA agents. We closed our broadcast last time by talking about Secord's testimony about using DEA people in a CIA capacity and the curious pressure being put on Tony Abergan and Martha Honey where someone in their uh, immediate uh, what, what, what's the word? There's an immediate circle of associations was stung on a phony cocaine setup. So, again, these things uh, are unnervingly prophetic here in Kruger's book and very relevant to the situation today. But Orlando Bosch and Carew are the names we're going to look at now. Now, tra- tracing a little bit the, 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 the larger origins of this particular uh, milieu, again, reading from the great heroin coup. Miami is the center of a huge conspiratorial milieu whose personnel wind through the Bay of Pigs, attempts on Castro's life, the JFK murder, and the great heroin coup, and which is now reaching out with a vengeance to Latin America and Europe. To trace the roots of this milieu, we must refer to the immediate aftermath of World War II, when the CIA began its close cooperation with Adolf Hitler's espionage chief Reinhard Galen, and the Soviet general Andrei Vlasov of Russia's secret anti-communist spy network. Vlasov's organization was absorbed into Galen's, which evolved into a European subsidiary of the CIA. U.S. and German agents mingled in Berlin and West Germany, paving the way for inroads into U.S. intelligence by former Nazi SS agents and Russian czarists. Headquarters of the CIA Galen Vlasov Combine staffed in the mid-50s by 4,000 full-time agents were in Pulak, near Munich. There Galen sang to the tune of more than one piper, having remained in touch with the old Nazi hierarchy relocated in Latin America, whose coordinator, Otto Scorzani, was in Spain. Scorzani had infiltrated the Spanish intelligence agency DGS and effectively controlled it single-handedly. With the onset of the Cold War, Galen's agents were recruited by the CIA for assignments in the United States, Latin America, and Africa. One agent reportedly was Frank Bender, allegedly alias Fritz Schwend, a key figure in the Bay of Pigs invasion. I should just put in parenthetically, Fritz Schwend, Freddy Schwend, otherwise known as Frank Bender, uh, was somebody we talked about a great deal, a key associate of Klaus Barbies, a key member of the drug, a key uh, part of the drug traffic, and also a man involved in getting a lot of Nazi money out of Europe, uh, as well as several other things. Financing the Vatican rat line through the Operation Bernhard, a currency sting directed against, the, against Great Britain, Incidentally, we're going to touch back ever so briefly on Friedrich Schwend as well as Klaus Barbie in the next part of our Iran-Contra series. Continuing, U.S. historian Carl Oglesby sees the origin of much of the CIA's later sinister record in the alliances it forged almost immediately upon its birth with the Galen Vlasov organization and, through Operation Underworld, with the Lansky Crime Syndicate. Quote, Everything after this the Galen Alliance, Oglesby writes, on top of Operation Underworld was probably just a consequence of this merger. How can a naive, trusting, democratic republic give its secrets to crime and its innermost ear to the spirit of Central European fascism and expect not to see its constitution polluted, its traditions abused, 
and its consciousness of the surrounding world manipulated ultimately out of all realistic shape. Now, again, uh, this is stuff we've been talking about, as we were ta saying at the beginning of the broadcast. This is stuff we've been talking about for years, folks, but this is exactly what we're seeing right now in Iran Contragate. We're seeing a group of people allied not only spiritually, but actually physically, you know, through, through money and, and uh, political connections and all that, directly to the, the Nazi intelligence services coming out of World War II and the, f the foundation of the CIA's uh, posture on the post-war world. We're seeing these same people today in the docket in Contragate uh, talking blithely about how uh, Congress was, was preventing the United States from doing what it needed to do to, you know, to stop the spread of communism, and by God, they were all just patriotic Americans, and uh, they're being allowed to talk on and on about this, and very little mention is made that, as we'll see during the broadcast tonight, that most of these people have been dealing uh, essentially smack and cocaine and guns to, to fascist child killers for years, um, and patriotism is a pretty weird word to hang on that kind of activity. I'm paraphrasing uh, an ominous term ominous phrase from Vietnam, it appears that at least in their mind it became necessary to destroy the republic in order to protect it. Uh, beyond that, it should be noted that these Galen connections are ongoing. We're going to be touching back on some of the Galen connections to the elements of the Iran-Contra hearings, and uh, Iran-Contra scandal, rather. In particular, we're going to focus on the von Bolschwing connections to, among other things, Stanford technology later in this broadcast. So this particular passage here that Kruger uh, has has written and, and relied on Carl Ogles before is not at all uh, in, it's not passe this is au courant and uh, this particular element of history is sticking with us to a considerable extent today continuing with Kruger's account well put moreover it is ironical that Europe's contribution to US fascism is now returning home and threatening the continent in a conspiracy supported by US economic and clandestine forces the forces Oglesby speaks of were united during and after the Bay of Pigs affair, and their fellow bed and their bedfellows were big businessmen with their own private interests. The merger was toasted in Miami. Excuse me, just uh, getting our tape going here. The Bay of Pigs invasion itself was not the most important phase in the development. That was station CIA station J M Wave and its Operation Forty the agency's secret war on Cuba from the summer of 1961 until the end of 1965, four years during which a truly conspiratorial powerhouse was forged in Miami. Station J.M. Wade was unique in the annals of the CIA, as attested to by then Deputy Director of Intelligence Ray S. Klein. It was a real anomaly. It was run as if it were in a foreign country, yet most of our agents were in the state of Florida. People just overlooked the fact that it was a domestic operation. With the start of its secret war, the new station became the agency's largest and the command post for its anti-Castro operations worldwide. Its annual budget of 50 to 100 million dollars financed the activities of 300 permanent employees, most of them case officers who controlled an additional several thousand Cuban exile operatives. Every major CIA station had at least one officer, one case officer assigned to Cuban operations who ultimately reported to Miami. In Europe, all Cuban matters were, were routed through the Frankfurt station, which in turn reported to J.M. Wave. J.M. Wave covered everything and anything Cuban, wherever in the world it might be. Cuban representatives were shadowed in Japan, and a Cuban exile-led commando unit was sent to Helsinki to sabotage the 1962 International Socialist Youth Conference. As J.M. Wave was closing down in 1967, the agency sent another team of saboteurs to France to contaminate a shipment of lubricant bound for Cuba with a bacterial substance developed under its mind control project MKUltra. When poured in oil, it would ruin motors and other machines. I mention these scattered incidents only to elucidate the situation around the October 1965 murder of the exiled Moroccan opposition leader Mehdi Ben Barka in Paris. Ben Barka must have been J.M. Wave's number two target after Fidel Castro between the fall of 63 and the end of 1965. Castro, in 1963, had asked Ben Barka to arrange the first Tricontinental Congress, which was to be held in Cuba in January of 1966. The conference, aimed at third world solidarity against U.S. imperialism and support for Castro in Cuba, would signal a major setback for J.M. Wave and the CIA's plans for Latin America, where all the agency's major operations in the 1962-66 J.M. Wave era were focused. <laughs> 